Um, great. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to actually connect NERSC and we have a lot of different resources. Um, and so I'm going to go through and just give a kind of a high level introduction to what these different resources are, um, but in particular, how to actually connect to our systems. Um, so uh, I will talk a little bit about account setup. You probably have an account already if you're here, um, but if not, you know, we can we can talk about that a little bit. I'm going to talk about one of our resources called Iris. Um, so I'll explain what that is. Um, we'll go through how to actually connect to Perlmutter through SSH, um, Jupyter, and I'll briefly talk about No Machine, which is our current um, method for using any kind of GUI application on uh, NERSC systems. Um, we did just talk about submitting user tickets, but um, the, these sections down here at the bottom, the submitting user um, tickets, uh, navigating the documentation and the homepage, we're actually just going to do it together. So I'll just go to those websites and show you around a little bit so that when you go to them, when you need something, you kind of know where to go. Okay, <clears throat> so there are two types of accounts at NERSC. Um, there's your personal account, that's your user account. Um, that's how you authenticate to the system. You're gonna log in um, and uh, a PI, so like a principal investigator or project manager um, on a certain project can give you um, uh, a link so that you can request an account. So uh, if you are you know, joining a new lab or something and, and they're like, hey, you need to be able to use nurse systems, the principal investigator is the person who's going to give you that user account. Um, and then there's also um, project accounts. And so a project is, is kind of like the bank account that you use to pay for your computer time. And it also um, may sort of uh, decide how much file storage usage you have. So um, the, the community file system, that space is actually allocated to projects kind of like the compute hours are. So some projects get you know, 100 hours, some get 200 hours based on what they request through this ERCAP process that um, Rebecca mentioned. Um, so that's something that a PI or a PI proxy will have done already. If you're a user um, within a project, um, your, your PI will kind of handle that part for you, um, but you will be charging to that account, right? So it's not, it's not money. I mean, it is kind of money, but you, you're, you're not paying. It's just, you're saying, okay, I need to use 10 hours. And so you kind of end up paying, uh, you know, 10 hours or something like that. Um, so everyone should be in at least one project. You may be in more. Um, and so that means you may have to keep track of, okay, I'm doing this work. So I need to charge to this account, uh, doing this work. So I need to charge to another account. Um, you'll have a default project, which means if you don't specify the account. So when you're, we're, we're going to talk about submitting jobs tomorrow, but there's a way to to get access to compute resources on Perlmutter and then um, ask it, ask Perlmutter to actually do your computation and it's gonna look for that account to charge. So you'll have a default that you can set up, um, which means, okay, most of the time I'm gonna be charging this account, um, you know, that if you don't specify the account or you can specify it and use a different one. Um, and so you'll see that in a moment when we go through what Iris is because you can actually see what these different projects are. Um, before you even get started, um, there's basically, there's actually two sort of agreements that you must um, read and uh, accept and, uh, you know, sign. Uh, one is our appropriate use policy. Um, so this goes through, you know, what, what are you allowed to do on the system and what are you not allowed to do on the system? You know, there are things that NERSC is meant to do. It's meant to be used for scientific research. It's not meant to be used for mining Bitcoin. Um, so if you decide to do that, you will be in violation of this policy. And then, you know, we would take the next steps um, accordingly. Um, I don't think that's ever happened. I think people are uh, respectful of the system and use it the way they're supposed to. Um, but that's, you know, because we have this policy in place and you do have to um, sign it when you uh, get your account. So this, if you have already signed into Iris, um, some of you may have, you probably have already read and checked it and, you know, agreed to it. Um, but if not, that's one of the first things that will kind of pop up automatically. Um, and then we also have a code of conduct. Um, so our code of conduct is because, you know, as we want our users to engage with each other and engage with us more, um, you know, we want our, our users to feel more like a community rather than just people who use this resource. Um, it means that we need to have a way of, you know, how are we going to communicate with each other? How are we going to treat each other? Um, just to avoid any problems, um, you know, if, if people feel like um, unsafe for some reason, it makes it so that our community can't 
reach its potential. And so um, again, we haven't had any issues. Um, so I don't want anyone to feel like they're walking into something kind of crazy. There's been no issues. We have a wonderful community of extremely uh, professional and respect, uh, re respectful um, uh, people. Um, but we do have a code of conduct just in case so that we can remember, hey, this is why we're here and this is why how we treat each other. Um, so you will also be asked to sign this when you uh, first um, start using the system. And that will also be through that IRIS system. So um, you, you, you should see it sort of pop up and you'll be asked to read it and sign it. Um, any questions about those? And if there are, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm not seeing the chat, so I'll let uh, Charles and Rebecca kind of uh, handle that. Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> security is really, really important to us, uh, making sure that only the people who are allowed to access the system do in fact ask, access the system. Um, so it is, it's never okay to share your password. Um, you need to set your password and change it. And I just changed mine this morning. Um, I, <laughs> my, mine had actually expired over the weekend. And so uh, this morning when I went to log in, um, I couldn't. Um, so I had to sh change my password. You change it every year. Um, make sure to, to set a good good password. So if you need help with what that is, you can probably look up online. We don't actually have any requirements of what that password is, um, but I think it does tell you if it's a good password or not. So um, it's not like we say you need one capital and one symbol and blah, 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 but it will just sort of, there's some metric that says, hey, this is a pretty good password or, hey, this is not that great. So an, an example of a bad password is something like nurse password or, uh, you know, my password and then like a date or something like that. So anything kind of obvious is just not um, a very good option. Um, so make sure you pick uh, a, a secure password. Um, if you have any troubles logging in, um, you if you try multiple times, um, the uh, you'll, you'll you'll kind of get locked out. And so there's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can, uh, you should still be able to log into Iris. Again, we're going to talk about that. It's kind of like a, a sort of management system that we have um, for, for, for nurse users. So you, you should be able to log into that and clear those failures. But if not, you can use the um, forgot password. Um, there's a forgot password button on, I on the first page of Iris and you can just reset it like you would for maybe any other type of account um, that you have if you forgot your password. Um, and then, or you can always email us or submit a ticket. Um, actually, if you if you submit a ticket, I think you have to be able to log in. So for some reason you're having problems logging in, you can always just email us and we'll, we'll get to the bottom of, of it for you. Um, so there's multiple ways to get help um, and it shouldn't depend on you. You know, if you, if you can't log in and we didn't have a method to, to get help, then, then that would be kind of a problem. Um, and then the next thing is you must have multi-factor authentication set up. Um, so uh, this is another way that we keep our system really secure, keep it from being used inappropriately by bad actors, by people who are not um, allowed to use or, you know, authorized to use our system. Um, and so it's really important to us that you use it. Um, you have to, there's no way around it. Um, so if you uh, have never used multi-factor authentication, we're going to talk about it a little bit. Um, but it's done in Iris. So we really need to get around to what, what is Iris? <laughs> so now I'm going to talk about, um, this thing I've mentioned multiple times. Um, and so I like, I feel like I learned things through analogies uh, this, this may or may not be helpful to you, but I think of Iris as kind of like the lab notebook for resource tracking, uh, at NERSC. Um, so it just does all these things that are important and useful as an as when you're using NERSC, um, but aren't directly like compute. So for example, it manages your password, your multi-factor authentication. It's it's keeping track for you of your compute hours, your storage space, your projects. Um, you can check your jobs there. So it'll have a full history of your jobs and the hours that were charged. Um, and there's actually a lot of other features in there as well. Um, that's where PIs, so pro, uh, principal investigators on projects, can do a lot of management of their users um, and so forth. So I'm actually going to take us into Iris right now and um, show you what it looks like. So, um, and actually I wanted to, let's see, if can I log out of here? Log out. Okay. So when you first arrive, you should get this page right here. Um, 
And when you click log in, um, it'll take you to this federated ID um, uh, and you're going to pick NERSC. So if you have something else here, you need to pick NERSC because you're going to be using NERSC credentials um, to log in. Um, mine is probably already logged in because I logged in this morning, but that's where you would be asked to enter your um, password. And then the next screen after that would be um, uh, your MFA. Um, so the first time you log into Iris, you if you don't have MFA, um, you don't like you just get to log in because it knows you haven't been able to set it up yet. Um, but then the first thing you want to do is go to this MFA tab and um, set up your MFA. Um, and let me see, did, let me just double check um, because I don't want to actually. Oops, no, okay, um, do it. But sorry about that. Live demos. Um, so what you end up doing is pressing this uh, token button. Uh, let's say, let's do test. Okay. And then it's going to show you um, a QR code and a, uh, a, uh, a bunch of other information. You're going to use this QR code to, um, uh, to scan with your, um, uh, I'm going to delete this. Um, with your phone. So you're going to need some kind of authenticator app. Uh, we suggest using Google Authenticator. I think that's the main one. Um, there might be other ones out there, but I think Google Authenticator should be available on all of your, um, uh, uh, any type of phone that you have. Um, and and now I think there isn't a, uh, a way to do it uh, through your browser. Can someone verify that? I always use my phone. Oh. There yeah, so if you if you look at our MFA page, there mm. are descriptions of of, of alternatives. Um, okay. If you're like, for example, if you work in a place where you can't take your phone in, right? Then mm. obviously this is this isn't going to work for you. Right. Uh, but there are alternatives, and so you can look look on our page to to find those and to try them. But please keep in mind that the one that we support is is Google. Uh, Google Authenticator, and we don't support any others. We'll try to help you a little bit, but ultimately it's up to you to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. And I'll show that in a moment once we get to um, the documentation, because I'll I'll show you how that works. Um, so so Iris, um, I, and I'm just noticing the time, so I want to keep moving here, but I would suggest the best thing to do in Iris is, um, actually, let me go back here for a second, is just go through these different tabs at the top and take a look and see what's in here. So you'll see, you know, what, what um, these are projects that I have access to. Um, I... <laughs> I don't really run jobs very much. So um, uh, you'll see all of your jobs here. Um, you can go through if you're looking, um, oh, did something fail? Did it work? How much did I get charged? So forth. You can see all of that information here, storage information, you know, how much space do I have and so forth. Um, so the, the best way to kind of figure out how to use Iris is actually just to get in there and click around and see what kinds of useful information are there. So here you can see information about HPSS and, you know, home use I pretty close to having filled my home directory somehow. Um, you know, this is a good place to go find that kind of information. Okay. Um, great. Yeah. Okay. So now we're going to actually talk about connecting to NERSC. Um, and I really, really like using this example. Um, so I'm wondering how many of you have seen this movie um, called The Martian? Um, has, I, I know Charles has seen it. I love this movie. Um, has anyone else seen this movie? Okay, cool. maybe one other person. No one has seen this movie. It's a great movie. Highly recommend it. Um, but there's this really fantastic part where um, it's it's kind of hard to see, but this is um, Donald Glover, and he's sitting here uh, running some computation. And in order to use the NASA supercomputer, he has his laptop. He's sitting in the data center. And he has some random cable connected from his laptop to a server rack. And so I just love it when I see movies where they're doing supercomputing and people go and sit there and, and try to connect to it directly because they think it'll be faster. Um, that is absolutely not the way to do this. Um, also really love that he has this thing that pops up and tells him his calculations are correct, um, which is kind of, I just think it's hilarious. Um, but again, the point is, love this movie, but this is hilarious. This is 
not how you're going to connect to an HPC resource. Um, we, we don't allow people in there. You can't just take your laptop and plug it in randomly. It's not going to make it go faster either. Um, so this is really what not to do. Um, and so when you watch this movie, you can tell all your friends, like, that is totally not how you use an HPC system. You do need, and it's way easier than going somewhere and plugging your laptop into something, is an internet connection, um, a terminal, um, and basically your login credentials. Okay. So now we have a video from our amazing Lisa, and she's going to tell us and show us how to log in. Welcome to NERSC. In this video, you will learn how to log into NERSC systems. NERSC is a scientific computing center at Berkeley Lab the national lab with the best views, as you can see. NERSC is located on the beautiful hills here in Berkeley, and our current system is called Permeter. My name is Lisa, I'm a performance engineer at NERSC, and I will guide you through the process of logging into Permeter with the SSH command. To get started, we need to open the terminal. If you are unfamiliar with using a terminal, you can learn more through the HPC Carpentries workshop that's linked in the video description below. Also, make sure you know your NERSC username and your password and have your MFA or multi-factor authenticator app set up. If you don't have any of those available, check out our documentation at docs.nurse.gov slash getting started. All right, I think we are ready. I open my terminal and type SSH and then my NERSC username is Elvis. So I type Elvis at permature.nurse.gov. If this is too long for you, you can replace Permuter with Sol. Fun fact, Permuter is named in honor of Sol Permuter, an astrophysicist at Berkeley Lab. He insisted on giving users the option of using Sol instead of Permuter to log in, since Sol is quicker to type than Permuter. Now hit the enter key, and if this is your first time signing on to Permuter, you will be asked to add an RSA fingerprint. Please type yes and press the enter key. The fingerprint will be added and in future you will not be asked again. Now you will be asked for your password and your OTP. OTP stands for one-time password. The OTP is obtained from the multi-factor authenticator app. It will be a six-digit number that changes every 30 seconds. If your password is, for example, ABCDEF and the OTP is 919595, type in a, B, C, D, E, F, 919-595, and press the Enter key. Yay, congrats, you made it. You are now logged into Permitter. To be precise, you are in a Permitter login note. If you encounter any issues logging in, check out our documentation on troubleshooting or submit a ticket to the nurse help desk. If you have comments or requests for additional videos, contact us at nurse-user-videos at lbl.gov. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, that is that is the best, one of the best ways to log in. Um, so welcome. Keep going. Okay, so um, with with SSH, you're basically just going to be using, I mean, re regardless of the method you use, you're going to be using the internet to connect um, to, to our systems. Um, you, If you want to use SSH, you'll need some kind of text terminal program. Um, so Macs, if you have a Mac, it's built in, um, or you can use whatever your favorite. There's other ones you can download. Um, iTerm2 um, is kind of a fancier one. Uh, for Windows, you might want to use PuTTY. Um, and then there's also uh, a couple other options. Um, I haven't used any of these. I haven't used a Windows machine in a while, um, but these are all uh, terminal options that you have. Uh, Linux, you should have plenty of options, uh, probably the main one, the, the, the built-in one. And then even if you have a Chromebook, there are a couple options um, for a text terminal. Um, and so again, I've never used these. Um, Probably we wouldn't be able to support too much. Like if you are having login troubles, we would try to help you, but I'm not sure that anyone at NERSC um, has really uh, any experience using or logging in through a Chromebook. So we might have to do a little bit of research. Um, okay, 
Then another way you can access NERSC um, through, uh, and this is nice because it's actually through um, a uh, internet browser, is through our Jupyter Hub. Um, so if you go to jupyter.nurse.gov, um, and we're going to talk in, de in depth more about what this Jupyter thing is, um, but it's basically a way to connect to um, our system and have kind of a sort of graphical environment um, in order to... Uh, interact with the system. So you log in um, uh, online, uh, you type in your username, password, and multi-factor authentication, just like you would um, for anything else. And then you will get presented with a couple different options of like what specifically you want to log into. So you might be able to log in directly to, a, or you definitely have access to a login node. Um, and again, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about these other options later, um, but you might be able to uh, access like directly into a CPU or a GPU node as well. And then you're going to see a big graphical environment, um, but it actually has a button down here, uh, somewhere in here, it'll have a button that says terminal. And this will pop up a, a basically like a tab within your internet browser that is a terminal that's on Perlmutter um, that's on the system. So um, now so now you don't have to SSH because you've kind of already done that. And this terminal is, is running on whichever node you are on in Perlmutter. Um, so it's it's like directly having access to a terminal. So you can do all the same things you would do otherwise. Uh, but then you also have kind of like a file browser on the side. So if that's more comfortable to you, it's easier for you, um, you have access to that as well. So I actually use Jupyter a lot of times because it's, it's just faster for me um, because I can just have my password saved and then I just type in my MFA and I'm in. So um, I, I do like using that, um, but you can do whichever you prefer. Um, I'm going to just, just mention this. I'm not going to spend time on this because we're running late, but there is a, an ability there, there is options if you want to run any GUI based application, um, uh, on our system. So if you, so, so they can be really slow over a network. And I don't know if you've tried this ever. Um, I used to have to SSH into a, um, uh, a university cluster in order to use Mathematica. And that was like, I, I couldn't handle it. I was ready to spend however much money I needed to get my own personal Mathematica because it was so slow. Um, and so we have some GUI based applications that we provide like MATLAB, um, DDT, Insight. Um, so you need to be able to run the, the GUI in order to, to use it, um, but it can be really, really slow. Um, so the way to do this is to use uh, no machine, which basically is a way of running the GUI inside of NERSC, um, like kind of like a, a pretend, um, uh, you know, um, like as if you had a, your monitor directly connected to a node, uh, but then it kind of broadcasts it to you um, over um, the slow network and it's sending a lot less information. So it makes... Uh, running these kinds of GUIs much faster. So um, you can get more information on how to set it up in our documentation. Uh, I'm going to go through our documentation in a moment. Um, and that's the best way for you to get that set up if you need it. Okay. Um, so we did talk about getting help using uh, tickets. Um, so just as a reminder, if you missed that, um, we have our help portal at help.nurse.gov. And this is the way to make what's basically what's called a ticket um, that goes directly to our consulting staff and somebody will help you with your question um, as soon as they can during business hours. Um, there's also request forms. So there are some storage options. Um, you get a default amount of storage space. For example, in Scratch, everybody starts with 28 terabytes. But sometimes you might be running a calculation and you're like, hey, I'm going to be producing, you know, 80 terabytes of data um, that I'm then going to run a process on in order to like, you know, call the data that I have. Um, and reduce it down, but I need a place to put 80 terabytes. And so you do have access to let us know, hey, you know, I could use a little bit extra space because for the next two months, I need to do this huge data analysis. And then once I'm done, I'll be done, right? So this this is a, a place where you can find that form to let us know, hey, I need a little bit more space. And then we can work with you if, if we think that that's reasonable. Um, I'm not going to go through this because we did already talk about how to submit a good ticket. And so now I'm just going to actually take us to the nurse documentation for a kind of live walkthrough. So this is, um, docs.nurse.gov is going to be a place that you will visit all the time. And it is extremely detailed and has tons 
tons and tons of information. Um, so again, it's a place where I recommend just going through, clicking around, trying to find you like, hey, okay, I'm going to need to do this. I'm going to need to do that. Um, and you'll find whatever information you need. You can also use the search bar. Um, so our search bar is actually pretty good. Um, and I uh, recommend, you know, trying to search for whatever you need. Um, and if you can't find it, then you can click around and see if you can find it that way. Um, again, if you, and if you really can't find what you need, you can always also ask uh, us and submit a ticket and we could help you. Cause sometimes things, um, you know, there's such a huge amount of information in here. It sometimes, um, you know, is a little bit hard to find. Um, but hopefully you can use this uh, navigation bar on the side and say, hey, okay, I, I'm ready to start running calculations. And we have tons of information here. Like, we're, and again, we're going to go through this tomorrow, but you know, what is the job? How, how do I get one? What do I do? What is scheduling? What are cues? Again, if none of this means anything to you, that's totally fine. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. But the other thing is, if we talk about it tomorrow and you still don't get it, you're always welcome to come here and get more information. So um, docs.nurse.gov is the place to come and get all of your technical information that you need for running on the system. Um, so we have tons and tons of information here, and I highly recommend keeping this open or <laughs> just memorize docs.nurse.gov, okay? Um, and then the last one I want to show you is our main webpage, which is nurse.gov. And so um, this is a web page that um, it's less, you know, it's, this is not the place to come if you have um, questions about, um, you know, how to use the system. That's docs.nurse.gov. Uh, but this is where you can find out about, for example, our training. So um, let's see, it's in users, nurse training. And then you can see all of our upcoming training events. If you miss something and you wanna go back to see it, you can click here to get our past ones. We have an archive of all of our old training. Um, this may or may not be super helpful because again, we keep we try to keep things updated and we're trying to make sure we're getting, you know, putting away things that were kind of outdated. Um, but let's say for some reason you wanna go through and see if you can find something, you're welcome to go through that archive. Um, but really, you may want to just look at the more recent um, training uh, because that'll probably be the, the best information. Um, this is where you'll also get information about our user group and all of our um, various activities that are happening. So we have our monthly community calls. We have our annual meetings. Um, and uh, we have an ex a NUGEX, which is our um, executive committee. So these are people who we meet with pretty regularly. We're kind of um, advocates for the users because these people are users, they're not nurse staff. So they come to us and they say, hey, you know, we we really think um, we need to work on this or, you know, you guys need to provide this. And that's how we get a lot of good feedback. Um, so you can find out information about that here. And then I think one of the best things is, and where is it? live status here? Yeah. Um, this is also a page that um, anytime you're having trouble logging in, I would actually recommend coming here first um, because it is possible. Sometimes we have, um, you know, something goes wrong and we have, uh, so right now Perlmutter is up, everything's up. You can see up means running, working, everything should be fine. Um, sometimes you'll see um, down for maintenance. Um, so those are usually scheduled uh, maintenance and you can get a list and see um, when those are uh, using our calendar. Um, so we have one coming up um, on the 25th. Um, I highly recommend adding this calendar to your calendar. Um, when I was in graduate school, somehow I would always end up planning to use, I was using Quarry at that time. I'd be like, oh, I'm going to get all this work done. And then suddenly I'd realize I couldn't get on Quarry because it was a day of maintenance. So I really recommend um, putting it in your calendar so you never get never never uh, get in that situation like I used to all the time. Um, and so I recommend coming here, quickly checking, hey, is the system okay? Is something wrong? Um, because you, and and th this is updated very, very fast. So as soon as something is, is uh, we become aware of something, there's usually some kind of note in here or something that will let you know, hey, okay, something's wrong, but we're working on it. Um, and uh, yeah, you can also see all of our planned outages here. Um, and then let's see, there's also, there's no spin uh, here. I think Sometimes they'll mention it somewhere here. So Spin is what hosts Jupyter Hub. So if you're having any problems with Jupyter Hub, um, you might want to come check here as well because there might be a Spin maintenance happening, and that's why you can't access Jupyter for some reason. Um, you do also get all this information in the weekly email, so please make sure to check that. 
Um, there's basically, uh, you know, we want to make sure that you have access to all the information you need so that you know when the system is available and if something goes wrong. Um, so again, this is a really, really good place to um, keep a bookmark and um, just, you know, take a quick peek if if something goes wrong. If you see everything is fine here, then maybe uh, feel free to submit a ticket and say, hey, you know, I'm not able to log in, but I see everything's fine. So what's going on? Um, and that is actually it.